you thankful that he's alive this morning? Um, I wanted to share something with you guys before we move on to the next song. Um, how many of you have kids, either grown um, or small ones, that just love to ask you so many questions? Right now I have um, a seven-year-old and a four-year-old, and, you know, their questions, they always start out really innocent and really simple, but as they get older, these questions get way more complex, and so... Um, for some reason, my kids love talking about the new heaven and the new earth that's going to be here after Jesus comes back. And, and so just a few days ago, Ryder, who's my four-year-old, was asking, Mom, are we going to sleep on the new heaven and the new earth when the earth comes down? Are we going to sleep? And I told him, I don't know. And Presley, being my seven-year-old who knows everything right now, <laughs> she told him, yes, Bubba, we're going to sleep because God rested on the seventh day, that means he took a nap. He slept. And I said, well, <laughs> I don't think that's what that meant. You can rest and not be asleep. And so she, being her, who's like her mother, was like, show me in the Bible where it says that God does not sleep. And so I had to actually bring up Psalm 21. I wanted to share this with you guys. It reminded me, um, it says that in Psalms 21, it says, um, talking about God, he will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he keeps Israel. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forevermore. And it was such a sweet reminder for me because I can remember I can remember so many times sitting up at night maybe grieving or being anxious and just knowing that he was never asleep on me that he was right there with me even in my happy times, in my insomnia and whatever, he was always there. And I know it's like the second song and y'all are saying, well, you're getting heavy already, but sometimes we just come here and we forget that we're coming to have this encounter with a God who, who just loves us so much and he, he never stops uh, watching us and he never stops wanting to be with us. And no matter what you're going through, he's always there even when we don't feel him. And so I don't want you to waste today. Sometimes you just get in the routine of coming and just singing our songs and maybe not really getting into worship till maybe the last song, but man, we, we don't, it's, there's not power in the words of the song. It's the power is who we're singing to. And so today I just encourage you to worship him and, and just be encouraged that no matter what's keeping you up at night, that he does not sleep, he does not slumber, and that he's just right there with you. Even if you feel all alone, he's going to be there for you. So let's just continue to worship him and whatever you have that's going on, I encourage you to give that to him this morning. You don't have to keep that same those same bondage, those chains, they can be gone today. And so let's just worship him this morning and, and just enter into his presence. He became sin.
Amen. Give the Lord praise this morning. Amen. And you may be reseated. So good to see each and every one of you today. And I, I pray that uh, this morning that you've sensed his presence in your life, and I pray that you will uh, get a touch, a fresh touch from him. We've been doing a series on the whole armor of God. We're up to uh, part four. I don't know how many of you guys know this now, but I'm a world-famous YouTube preacher. And uh, so I have about four people a week will check in and listen to my uh, sermons. And it's me and three others. So I think it's me and Ryder and Presley and one of my other granddaughters. So, uh, But you know what? I mean, as long as my grandkids like me, <laughs> that's, all, that's all that matters. Amen. I love them grandkids. My, uh, my kids are all right, but I really love, I love those grandkids. Amen. Um, you know, uh, I, uh, recently I, I watched a, uh, a series on, on Netflix on World War II, and I, you know, I had forgotten, it's been a while since I was, uh, I was in school, and, uh, I don't know about you guys, but when I was in school, that was some of the best naps I ever had. And so I, I you know, in history class, you, you, you supposedly learn a lot uh, about this. And, uh, you know, if you hadn't really thought about it, the 20th century was a very, very dangerous time to be alive on planet Earth. There was so much, so many things that happened. And, and this particular Netflix series was on World War II, and to see the different players of different nations, and it was literally a world war. America was sort of drug into it after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, but you had the Germans that were advancing, trying to conquer Europe and then eventually the world. You had the Japanese, you had the Italians, uh, you had the Russians. I mean, it was... And, of course, America got kind of pulled into it, and many of the lesser nations, and I don't mean lesser as far as importance, but just simply the fact they were smaller nations. And it was, such, it was, it was, a, it was a world war. And when you, you watch it and you see all of the, uh, the deaths and, and, the, and, and the destruction, uh, around 60 million people died as a result, including 6 million Jews, which were, uh, which were killed in the, in the Holocaust and the concentration camps. And you see the terrors, and you see the horrors of war. And I thought, as as I was com completing the, the watching that series on World War II, I thought, you know, if we as believers, if we could have our spiritual eyes opened, and we could see the spiritual battle that we're facing every day, a great fighter was asked one time, a great boxer was asked one time about being knocked out in a in a in a match, in a contest, in a fight. And he said, it's, it's the blows that you don't see coming that knock you out. Because if you see the guy wind up, and if it's an uppercut or a roundhouse or whatever he's trying to do, if you see it coming, you can take evasive action. I was in a very, very savage fight in elementary school. It was brutal. I mean, you talk about World War II. And I did the very best that I could in trying to defend myself, and I got, uh, I got beat pretty bad. But I have to admit, that was one of the toughest girls in school, people. So don't be, don't be judging me. But if you think about the spiritual battle that we're facing today, it should really sober us. I, you know, one of the things I think somewhere along the line, I, I picked up this information uh, that, you know, it, it said that ostriches, when they become fearful or they become afraid, they stick their heads in the sand. And that actually is not true. Ostriches don't stick their heads in the sand because they're afraid sometimes the females are to check on eggs or, or to place eggs. And so sometimes you might see them scratch in the dirt, but it's just to check on the eggs. But ostriches, <laughs> these are some pretty big birds, and they do generally try to, try to avoid conflict, and they will try to run. They can run up to 45 miles an hour. Why am I such an expert on ostriches? I have no idea this morning, but they can run up to 45 miles an hour, and they can be very dangerous if cornered. If they can, they can kick you, and they have uh, talons or something on the bottom of their feet that are so sharp that they could, it could be a fatal injury to a, to a human being. I just said all that to say this, that ostriches may not hide their heads in the sand, but a lot of Christians are doing that today. About this spiritual battle, 
that we're facing. And that's the reason why we're, we're talking about the, uh, the whole armor of God, part four. So uh, what I want to do, I've been taking one verse at a time, but I'm going to start back to, at the very beginning in Ephesians chapter 6, start with verse 10, so we can sort of summarize just a little bit of where we've been, and then we'll, we'll move forward into uh, our study in uh, part four. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. How many, of you, how many of you read your Bible? Come on, let me see. Do you read your Bible? <laughs> All right, how many of you are going to do better? Come on, I, you know, I just told on myself I should have been reading the Bible instead of watching a Netflix series, but it was educational, okay? So Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 says this, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. And I think that is, that, is the, that is the position that we need to live in. As believers, we need to live in a position of strength. I can promise you, and, and I don't know how many of you have ever read the book of Revelation. You know, one of these days I'm just going to do that series, a series on the book of Revelation, scare us all to death. Uh, I wonder, every day I, I wake up, you know, since we've been through 2020, now we're through 2021, and every day I wake up and wonder which chapter of Revelation we're going to live through today. It's some pretty scary stuff. So, so, so we might cover that. But I can tell you that uh, Jesus, Jesus talked about it, taught, and his, his early disciples wrote about it, and then some of the early church uh, apostles wrote about it. And then, of course, John in the book of Revelation is very clear about the fact that the closer we get to the return of Jesus, the tougher that things are going to get. It's going, to get, it's going to get a little difficult out there. It's, going, it's about to get for real. And so realize that we can't control all the things that are happening in this world today. Look, guys, we, we have been, as Americans, we have been incredibly sheltered. We have had it easy. I, you know, I know half of our country right now, they're all whining about being victims and everything. But I want to tell you something, man. If you want to know what it is to be victimized, why don't you go live in Africa for a while or South America you know, go, go live in Venezuela or, or one of those other countries. You know, communist and socialist countries, they put up walls to keep people in. In America, we put up walls to try to keep some of the terrorists. We're not trying to keep good people out, I don't guess. But, you know, you got terrorists and gang members and, and, and all these other people trying to come through. So, I, I, you know, America's not perfect, and we've got a lot of things we need to work on and correct. But I'm telling you something, it's the best thing afloat. And I don't want to live anywhere else but here, except for maybe Hawaii. But that's part of America, right? feel called to the mission field in Hawaii. Do anybody else has that same calling with me? Hawaii? I'm, I'm ready to go suffer for the Lord. You got to be careful because uh, God has a sense of humor, and I might choose Hawaii. He may send me to Greenland or Alaska or someplace like that, which I don't mind in the summer, but wintertime, I'm too old and frail to be living in that cold weather. We want to be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. And then, and then Paul goes on, <clears throat> verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. It's that punch that you don't see that's going to knock you out. But just because you don't see his hand working in your life, just because you cannot see demonic spirits, just because with your natural five senses you can't perceive the spiritual warfare, it's happening and it's for real. But he wants to launch a punch at your life that you never see coming. I've noticed that Whenever I face adversity in one area of my life, it seems like it's come, it comes from all different. The, he, the, our enemy shows no mercy. And you would think, you would hope that, man, you get knocked down and you're struggling to try to survive and you're hurting and you're in grief and you're in sorrow and you can't pay your bills and you just, the, the, the adversity is so intense, the battle so intense, you would think maybe the, the adversary would show a little mercy. He doesn't. He goes in for the kill. So we have to stand against the schemes, the attacks of the enemy. Another place, Paul said, we're not ignorant of the attacks or the schemes or the devices, or at least, or at least we shouldn't be. Verse 12, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, or, re or rather against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God. That means we should be proactive. And a, there's, a, there's a, like a little story that was told that a man actually had a chance to talk to God. And he asked God, God, why do you allow sorrow and suffering and people hurting in this world? And why don't you do something about it? 
And Jesus spoke to him and said, I was getting ready to ask you the same question. You know, we have to be proactive. God can't, God's not going to do everything for us. We have to put on, we have to take up that whole armor of God. Now, the bad news is the battle is for real. And the bad news is the battle is intense. The bad news is not everybody's going to survive the battle. People lose their lives in battle. And people will lose their souls, their eternal souls, in this spiritual battle. But the good news is, is God is on your side. And there's more for you than there is against you. Amen? That's good news today. That's a shame that the only one that clapped was the Baptist here today. Take up, so take up the whole armor of God. That you may be able to stand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, verse 14. We talked about this last week. Stand therefore having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. And today our, our study is going to be on verse 15. And as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. You may look at, uh, at the Roman soldier's armor, the stuff that he might wear, and you may pick certain pieces as being more important, but when you go back and you think about the different articles of clothing that he would wear to prepare himself to go into battle, you realize that all of it's, all of it's equally important. All of it is very essential. Understand the enemy never takes a day off. The enemy's never going to cut you any slack. He's never, he's never going to give you a break. And you say, man, I wish I, wish I could catch a break in life. Not going to happen. I, look, I know sometimes circumstances are good. Sometimes circumstances are bad. Sometimes it seems like your life's going a little bit easier than other times. But just because it seems like the enemy's taken a step back just for a moment, that's only because he's working to launch an attack against you that's even more vicious and more difficult than what you've experienced before. Uh, some of you, it's been pretty bad for you. I know, some in our church family, some in our, our community, it's been pretty bad. I got some really good news for you. It's going to get worse before it gets better. Oh no, it's going to get better. Trust me, it's going to be better. Because Paul said, if God is for you, who can stand against you? <laughs> Boy, that's some good news. That is, so, that is such a word of encouragement. I think you ought to take an offering for me. You know, that has never worked when I've suggested taking an offering for me in church. But that, that is good news. God is for you today. So you just got to hang on. Sometimes you're hanging on for dear life. But you just hang on and, and you just grab the hem of his garment and just hang on because I'm going to tell you something. God has a plan. And he, in the final analysis, guys, I've read the last page of the book. I just couldn't stand it. I had to go back and check it out. I read the last page of the book. And you know what? We win. We win. Amen. So the enemy is constantly testing us, always looking for areas of our life to try to exploit weakness. You know, uh, I, I know a lot about sports, not because I played sports. I tried, but I, I never really got on the basketball court. I played a little bit of basketball in high school and such, but I just sat on the bench and watched the good players play. So I learned a lot by watching good players play basketball. And so one of the most, uh, one of the most dominating athletes I've seen in my lifetime was, was Michael Jordan. And you know, um, it's been 16 years since Michael Jordan played in the NBA, but he still out-earns every NBA player when it comes to sneaker income. And the ranking isn't even close. In 2019, Jordan earned $130 million from his Nike deal. That's one year Nike paid him $130 million just to have a, spe uh, a sneaker in his name. If life was fair, they would do that for pastors. If you'll pay me $130 million, I will wear whatever shoes that you want me. I will wear whatever clothes that you want me to. No matter how ridiculous that I may look, I could get over it for $130 million. And you know, since the inception of his deal in 1984, <laughs> Nike has paid him over $1.3 billion. So footwear for us may be something a little bit different than when we think about putting on the shoes that uh, the shoes on our feet which uh, put on the, the readiness given by the gospel of peace. So it's, it's, a, it's a little bit different because shoes today it's more of a fashion statement. But, and, but, but you know like Michael Jordan's shoes have become so valuable and, and there was an article in G, GQ magazine that estimates that ne nearly 1,200 people die every year because people are trying to steal their Jordan sneakers. 
That's just, that's just an estimate. I don't know how accurate that is, but, but you'll see from time to time it, it's, that kids will uh, they'll rob somebody and sometimes they kill them to try to get their Air Jordans. So for us, shoes are more of a, a fashion statement. But it should be very obvious to us, and of course basketball players and football players and, and baseball players, they all want to wear the right equipment. They all want to wear shoes that give them the advantage. And that's exactly what Roman soldiers would do. Because, you know, when you're going down a basketball court, it's not, you're not, you're just playing for endorsements. You're playing for money. All of the sports, it's the same thing. But if you're going into battle, you're fighting for your very life. And so the shoes would be very, very important because these Roman soldiers many times would often march 20 miles a day. And then they would head into head-to-head combat. And in battle, much of victory or defeat will rest upon a person's readiness. Remember, it's that blow that you don't see coming that will knock you out. And for these Roman soldiers, it was important the footwear that they had because they'd have to march many miles. And then you could imagine that your ability to evade sword thrust and spear thrust and all those types of things it would be very important, and you, your shoes would be very important, because you can imagine <clears throat> trying to fight a battle. This is hand-to-hand combat. Fight this battle, and your feet being injured or a loss of mobility, you're probably not going to survive that. So taking care of your feet and, and wearing the right footwear would be very important. Peter said it this way in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. He said, be sober minded, be watchful. The NLT says, re, uh, renders it this way, be alert. For your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Not only I've obviously proved that I'm an expert on ostriches, but I know quite a bit about lions too. I watch way too much Discovery Channel when I'm not watching Netflix series on World War II, or reading my Bible 12 hours a day. I just heard a little bit of laughter there. I'm thinking, you you guys are a little suspicious of that. Yeah, I would. I only only lie when I can get away with it, and I did not get away with that one. But you know, we're we're really really in interesting times here because obviously, as, as the church, or it's true of businesses, our school systems, government, everything, we've sort of had to pivot just a little bit from our normal routines, right? So churches, we've had to try to be creative. I had about as much interest, I, I had about as much interest, interest in filming myself and putting it on YouTube as I would catching the coronavirus. I had no desire to do either one of them. But you just have to give the people what they want, folks. You know, and there's four people out there that hang on to my YouTube videos every... <laughs> my grandkids want it. They want it so bad. But, but, you know, we've had to pivot a little bit. And so, uh, and, and there are times, and it, it's understandable, you have to, you have to, you know, we're people of faith, right? And we know God's going to take care of us, but we have to use wisdom, right? And, and, and so we have to protect ourselves. And so every person knowing their own uh, physical health, their situation, has to make decisions about where they're going to go. And that was the reason why we wanted to do the YouTube, just in case anybody, for whatever random reason, Maybe just sit there and make fun of me. But anyway, they'd watch the YouTube video. And, and, but it would, it would help us to stay connected. But, but one of the challenges that we're going to have as we develop the herd immunity and people, I guess more people are vaccinated and, and more people have had it. And so I guess you develop the immunity that way. One of the challenges we're going to have is there are going to be a lot of folks that have just gotten so used to not going to church that it's just going to be easy it's just to kind of... I don't know about you guys, but I, I need... I need the fellowship that I have with, with fellow believers. I really, really need that. It doesn't take, look, look, I'm a, I'm a pastor, right? And, and I, I hope, my hope, from time to time, my life is an example. But sometimes, you know, it bothers me. Look, it bothers me when there are hypocrites in the church. But re- what really, really bothers me is when I'm that hypocrite. When I'm, not, not because I'm trying to deceive anyone, not because I'm trying to fool anyone, but just because there are times I know in my life, my life is inconsistent with the message that I'm trying, I'm trying to preach. And I, and I get that. But you know, with Paul, uh, Peter said, that beware because the devil goes about as a roaring lion. And when you, when you watch the Discovery Channels or uh, 
National Geographic Wild, whatever, whatever channel it might be, the way that lions hunt is, is the male lions, and I think this is totally cool, now, and I want all of us to pay attention to this. The male lions sit back at the location where the pride is, and they just chill. And the female lions go out and make the kill. Can I get an amen here? I mean, I've heard of these guys. You know, Listen, I've heard of these guys that are really bothered by the fact that their wives make more money than them. Now, I'm a single guy, and if the Lord brings me a rich woman, I'm going to ride that gravy train, baby. I ain't, ain't going to sweat that for one moment. Baby, bring in that money. Show me the money. <laughs> That was so random. I don't know why I had to share that. <laughs> but, but you know what the lions do? The lion, those female lions, those lionesses, they go out and instinctively they will hunt, whether it's a flock or a herd or something. They will go out and they, they will hunt. And instinctively they will single in on part of the prey, whether it's a gazelle or whatever they might be hunting. They will single out. They will find one that's either young or it's an older animal that doesn't have the ability to escape as it could have in its younger days or one that's injured. And you know what their first line of strategy is? Is to try to isolate that, that animal from the herd. Satan does the exact same thing. His number one job, his number one strategy is to try to isolate you from the, from the body of Christ. Look, I know sometimes attending church can be hazardous to your faith. I get that. But I'm going to tell you something. I need the times when I am encouraged by people and, and I can be with them and they can encourage me. And because together, together we're going, we're going to make it. So be careful, Peter said, because the devil goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Jesus said it this way when he was praying with his disciples in the garden, or he was praying in the garden of Gethsemane just hours before his trial and cruci crucifixion. Mark chapter 13, verse 33. Be on guard, Jesus said. Keep awake. And some manuscripts will add the word and pray. Be on guard. Keep awake. Pray. For you do not know when the time will come. There are things that will happen in your lives. There are going to be blows that you're going to uh, take on that you never saw coming. Things that are going to come into your life that you never saw coming. A doctor's report, financial difficulties, laid off from your job. Life can be so uncertain. Understand, Jesus said that you have to be on guard. Keep awake. Don't let the enemy isolate you from the herd. Don't let him isolate you from the flock. Because, I mean, one of the things he will do, he'll get on your shoulder and he'll start pointing out inconsistencies. He'll start pointing out the fact, look, none of us are perfect. None of us are perfect. And the enemy will, will, will try to get you to focus in on the imperfections of others and use that in so many other areas that he will try to use that to try to discourage you in being part of the body of Christ. If, if you want, I'm going to tell you something, if you want to attend an awesome church, help make it awesome. It doesn't take any effort to sit back and criticize and complain about this, that, or the other. Pray for your pastor. Oh, Lord, pray for your pastor. Can I get amen? <laughs> pray for your pastor. Pray, pray for your church leaders. Pray for your brothers and sisters in Christ. Pray for your spouse. Couples that pray together, stay together. Don't fight with your spouse. Fight for your spouse. Come on, people. We got to realize that, that we are not each other's enemy, but the enemy's out there, and we have to put on the whole armor of God, and we have to be a source of encouragement and strength for each other. Paul refers to our message as a gospel of peace. And understand that when these attacks come, when the enemy comes against us, his main objective is to steal our peace. Jesus said this to his disciples on the last night that he would be with them. He said this, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled. Neither let them be afraid. You see, the disciples were, they were having, beginning to try to process the fact Jesus on this night, as he had done other occasions, was trying to explain to them that he was not going to be with them much longer, but he was going to be delivered in the hands of the religious leaders and he was going to, he was going to be crucified. He was going to die. They're having a hard time processing that. They're, you know how it is sometimes. It's, 
the shock. When we, re we receive uh, bad news in the first stage, I think of grief as denial. And so we kind of go through that. And I think the disciples were in denial. But to prepare them for his death, and I think even to help us prepare for our own, Jesus said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. But don't let your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. These were his, some of his last words to his disciples. Do you, you don't think on that last night that the things that Jesus shared with his disciples weren't important? I mean, if you, had, if you, if you live to be 100 years old and your family's gathered around and you have an opportunity to share some thoughts, some last thoughts with your family before you die, I think you probably would want to share something very important to be your last words. So some of Jesus' last words to his disciples is, is just have my peace. I'm going to leave my peace with you, but don't let your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Isaiah, Isaiah said this way, eight centuries before Christ came, Isaiah 53, 5, but he was pierced for our transgressions. Aren't you thankful we have forgiveness for our sins? Well, you're not looking at a perfect person, but you're looking at somebody that's forgiven, and I'm thankful for his forgiveness. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us, what? Peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. His death was not only about forgiveness of sins, which is the most important. I'm thankful this morning that we have abundant life now in Christ and we have eternal life when we die. I'm so thankful for that. But his death was not only about forgiveness of sin, but it was about our peace, our peace of mind. Jesus, his death upon the cross, he was wounded for, he was bruised. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities, a chastisement of our peace. He took the punishment so that every day of our lives, you and I, could live with a peace that passes all understanding. Doesn't, the peace doesn't mean that there won't be storms brewing around us. Sometimes God calms the storm. Most of the time, he calms his child in the midst of the storm. And that's the peace that he wants you to live with today. But it's a, it's a, it, this gospel, this gospel that we preach, that Paul referred to as the gospel of peace, it's a gospel that changes lives. It's not about being religious. It's not about learning the rules of a church. It's not just about learning the Christian culture or the Christian vocabulary that we have, but it's about having a transformation in our life. Paul said it this way, if any man's in Christ, he's a new creature. We become born again, as Jesus said in John chapter 3. We become born again by the Spirit of God. And if any man's in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things pass away, and all things become new. You know what that tells me? That as a follower of Jesus, I don't have a past, but man, do I have a future. I came across a, just a wonderful testimony, and, and I don't generally do it this way, but I, I want to read this testimony from this individual's own words about a transformation that takes place in a person's life. Oftentimes we, we see these powerful salvation experiences of people, maybe that they have been in gang activity or maybe they've been in drugs, or, but this story is nothing like this at all. This, was, uh, this, is, this, this lady writes this, As early as grade school, when I was a voracious reader and a straight-A student, I identified with being smart. And I believe smart people didn't need religion. As a result, I just declared myself an atheist and dismissed people who believed in God as uneducated. In high school, I led a classroom debate arguing for a godless form of evolution, confident my side would win because this was science. When the class voted and award victory to the creation side, I was dumbstruck. Most people didn't understand science, I figured. Either that or they were unduly swayed by the most popular girl in class. She had a swimming pool in her backyard and threw fun parties. At that time, I babysat to earn money. One of my favorite families was a young couple, both a husband, who was a doctor, and his wife, and they were very sharp. One night after paying me, they invited me to church. She said, I was stunned. People this smart actually went to church? When Sunday morning came around, I told them I had a stomachache. They invited me again the following week, but once more I came down with another phantom st stomachache. The more they persisted, the more I struggled to invent convincing excuses. You try faking illness with a doctor. Was it just a phase? 
Eventually, the couple tried a different tack. You know, they said going to church is not what matters most. What matters is what you believe. Have you read the Bible? I figured that if I wanted to be an educated person, I needed to read the best-selling book of all time. The doctor suggested starting with Proverbs, reading one chapter daily for a month. When I opened the Bible, this was the King James Version, and I expected to find phony miracles, made-up creatures, and assorted gobbledygook. And I would wish somebody would, if you could Google that term, I have no idea what gobbledygook is, so see me after service. She continues, but to my surprise, Proverbs was full of wisdom. I had to pause while reading and think. I quietly bought a modern translation called The Way and, through the, and read through the entire Bible while I never heard actual voices or anything to justify summoning a neurologist. I felt this strange sense of being spoken to. It was disturbingly yet oddly attractive. I began wondering whether there might really be a God. I decided to work my way through the Bible again, thinking that perhaps my experience was common for first-time readers. This time I would step back and read it more carefully. The better to debunk it, I also vowed to learn about the Bible's origins and to study other religions. Maybe, I thought, in my culture, in which most people were Christians or Jews, was conditioning me to find Christianity attractive. A favorite Jewish teacher at my high school ran a gifted program and let me devote one class each semester to whatever I wanted. I studied Buddhism, Hinduism, and several other faiths. I visited temples, synagogues, mosques, and other holy places. More than anything, I wanted to get this religious phase or get past this religious phase because I knew I did not want religion. But despite my wishes, an eternal, internal battle raged. Part of me was increasingly eager to spend time with the God of the Bible, but an irritated voice inside of me insisted I would be happy again once I moved on. There were two passages that I found troubling, Matthew 10, 33, but whoever disowns me before others, I would disown before my Father in heaven. And Matthew 12, 30, whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. I resented what felt like an, unwalk, an unwelcome ultimatum. I didn't want to believe in God, but I still felt a peculiar, peculiar sense of love and presence I couldn't ignore. During my freshman year in college, I reconnected with a friend I had met at Summer's Honor Program. He was a straight-A student and a star on both the basketball court and football field. I had never known anyone so smart and athletic. He helped me with my difficult phys physics homework, and then he invited me to his church. This time, I felt fine. The sermon prompted many questions. I started to raise my hand while the pastor spoke before realizing that everyone else was sitting quietly. I nudged my friend. Can we ask questions? He hushed me. How do we learn if we can't ask? After the sermon, I tried getting answers, but most people wanted to socialize. I started coming to Sunday school classes because the teachers let me ask questions. I also kept reading. One Sunday, the pastor talked about the difference between believing there is a God and following God. I knew Jesus claimed to be the way to God, by, but I had been trying to avoid anything Jesus-related. I, I couldn't help hearing his name with the word freak attached. But the pastor got my attention when he asked, Who is the Lord of your life? He discussed what happens when you, a human being, put yourself on the throne. I was intrigued. I was the captain of my ship. But was it possible that God would actually be willing to lead me. From there, I came to a deeper understanding of what it meant to have a relationship with God through faith in Jesus. It seemed silly to pray about it. After all, I still had doubts about God's existence. But in the spirit of Paschal's wager, I decided to run an experiment before I had much to gain and, and very little to lose. After praying, Jesus Christ asked you to be Lord of my life, my world changed dramatically as, as if... Uh, as if a flat black and white existence suddenly turned full color and three-dimensional. I had lost nothing, or I had lost nothing of my urge to seek new knowledge. In fact, I felt emboldened to ask even tougher questions about how the world works. I felt joy and freedom, but also a heightened sense of responsibility and challenge. Have you ever tried to assemble something mechanical and it only kind of works? Maybe the, the wheels spin, but not smoothly, and then you realize you... We're missing a piece. When you finally put it together correctly, it works beautifully. This is how it felt when I handed my life over to God. I thought it had worked fine before, but after it was fixed, it works exponentially better. 
That's not to say nothing bad ever, bad ever happened to me, far from it. But in all things, good and bad, I could count on God's guidance, comfort, and protection. Today, I'm a professor at the top university, MIT, which is Massachusetts Institute of Technology. In my field, I have incredible colleagues who have helped me translate my lab research into difference making products, including a smartwatch that helps care caregivers save the lives of people with epilepsy. I work closely with people whose lives are filled with medical struggles, people whose children are not healthy. I do not have adequate answers to explain all their sufferings, but I know there is a God of unfathomable greatness and love who freely, freely enters into relationship with all those that confess their sins and call on his name. I once thought I was too smart to believe in God, and now I know I was an arrogant fool who snubbed the greatest mind in the cosmos, the author of all science, mathematics, art, and everything there is to know. Today I walk humbly, having received the most undeserved grace. I walk with joy alongside the most amazing companion anyone could ask for, filled with desire to keep learning and exploring. Testimony of Rosalind Picard, who is the founder and director of the Effective Computing Research Group at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. What a, what a great testimony of a life changed. And that's the result. When we put on the shoes, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace, that we can share the good news. And that's what the gospel means, good news. And we can see lives changed and transformed. Father, we just thank you today, Lord, for the opportunity to be in your house. And Lord, I just pray for each one of us. Lord, uh, I don't know if, if, if all of us here have made that commitment to Christ, but I pray, Lord, if there are any here today that have not received him, I pray, Lord, that they would just, that they would abandon everything else, leave everything else, and follow you. And we're thankful, Lord, for your gospel that changed our lives. Your gospel, Lord, that has replaced the despair and the hopelessness with hope and comfort and peace in these very difficult days in which we live. I pray, Lord, that we'll put on the whole armor of God and be alert, be watchful, and pray because it's that blow that we never see coming that's going to knock us out. Go with us, Lord, I pray. Use us to bring glory to your name and to make a difference in our community. We ask, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for being here today. You are dismissed.